All right, so let's get started. The talk is about the interplay between quantum and cryptography, and uh, especially about uh, applications whose security is against depth bounded quantum adversaries. With a recent engineering development on quantum computers, for example, the Google Sigamore and the most recent Osprey by IBM, a 443 qubit quantum machine, the community believe that the era of quantum computing is approaching pretty fast. Quantum computer challenges traditional cryptography, but also provides a lot of unique properties and opportunities to modern cryptography. On one hand, quantum computers may severely compromise the security of existing cryptographic schemes, for example, doing integer factoring in polynomial time, which are real threats for many modern crypto. On the other hand, the fascinating power of quantum information also offers us a lot of opportunity to achieve new and exciting functionalities like quantum money and quantum copy protection. But um, despite of giving lots of groundbreaking, uh, groundbreaking applications, all this application requires both noise tolerant quantum computers and also low co uh, long coherence time. And even with this most advanced quantum technology that we have today, all this application, they are still quite limited and far away from you know, demonstrating any of these examples. So we want to build something only with the current imperfect quantum devices. I think one of the most famous example is uh, what we call quantum key distribution. Key distribution is a task for two users to exchange a key while preventing anyone else from learning that key. The protocol can be done with only NISC devices and has been implemented by many organizations. Its security holds even against full-scale quantum computers. And this is um, basically uh, everything we know about cryptography with only NISC devices. And it's very intriguing to ask the following question. If we can build more applications with only the current state of quantum technology. And in this work, we show that we can achieve another classically impossible applications in the NISC era. And we do this by uh, relaxing the notion of security and only consider security against bounded depth quantum adversaries. So uh, in this work, we show that we can achieve another application in the NISC era. Um, and more formally, we show that um, uh, cryptographic functionalities called one-time memory can be constructed in the NISC era. And in our construction, uh, basically to run an honest protocol, you only need a constant depth quantum circuit. And whereas for all uh, bounded polynomial depth quantum circuit, the scheme is secure. Here, the, the depth bounded should be fixed before the protocol, and it will be fit as a parameter into the protocol uh, preparation procedure. And uh, in the middle of the picture is an example of the uh, bounded depth quantum adversary we considered. So this quantum, this bounded depth quantum adversary uh, can be uh, viewed as a, a sequence of classical circuit followed by quantum circuit. And the classical circuit can have arbitrary polynomial depths, but the quantum circuit has only low depths. And after the quantum circuit, there will be a measurement follow, uh, follow that circuit. So you can think about it as a shallow quantum circuit interleaved with uh, some very pretty large and heavy classical computation. And next I will talk about what is one-time memory. A one-time memory is a piece of device that stores two values, M0 and M1. Um, given the device, anyone can read out the, any value M0 or M1 by his or her choice. And that's the basic functionality. But the, the most important thing is about its security. And the security says that no one can read out two values, M0 and M1, at uh, the same time, simultaneously. And note that this is a non-interactive protocol. Uh, otherwise, this task is actually pretty easy from uh, like oblivious transform. Uh, the difficulty is that here, uh, this protocol being non-interactive is that the adversary has full access to this advice and can arbitrarily play uh, with this advice. So one-time memory is a very powerful task and can give many implications like one-time obfuscation and one-time zero knowledge proof. But however, uh, one-time memory is uh, proved to be impossible classically because you can think about 
uh, if this uh, this classical device is uh, encoded in a piece of classical information, and you can easily duplicate the classical information. And then you can simply run this extraction procedure uh, twice with input being B, uh, with input being zero and one. And you can simply read out both M zero and M. And the security seems to uh, suggest that quantum may give you one-time memory because you know, like it seems like if you can read out M zero M one, then the the quantum device may collapse and it prevents you from reading the other value. But unfortunately, this task is even quantumly impossible. And the reason is that if a one-time memory satisfy the correctness or this uh, functionality here, um, then you can always read out M0 and then rewind the device back to its original state without destroying it and read the other value by basically the gentle measurement method. So, um, so this task is also quantumly impossible. And furthermore, uh, we show that this one-time memory is indeed achievable with hardware assumptions. So what's hardware assumption? It's basically an assumption that uh, put restrictions and limitations on how quantum or classical adversary has access to the devices. So there are uh, a sequence of work showing that quantum memory can be constructed with uh, all kinds of hardware assumptions. And in this work, we show that indeed quantum memory is possible against death bonded adversaries. And you can think about death bonded adversary is another form of hardware assumption, but we think comparing to all the hardware assumption made in the previous work, this is the uh, the mildest hardware assumption and also gives a very interesting application uh, with only in these quantum devices. All right, so the construction uh, consists of two building blocks. First of all is a BB84 state. And in other words, it's a sequence of quantum states simply being a, a concatenation of zero, one, plus, and minus states. And we further require that the number of states um, encoded in the computational basis uh, is the same as the number of states encoded in the hardware basis. And therefore, we can define two classical strings, xc and xh. They are of the same length. Each h is of exactly half length of the original quantum state. And then you can think about this xc is a classical string encoded in the computational basis, and xc uh, and xh is a is a classical string encoded in the hardware basis. And each xc and xh uh, is used for masking the message we want to store. So uh, to store m zero, we basically store the encryption of m zero, and the encryption is indeed m zero masked with the hash function evaluated on xc. And similarly, m1 is masked with the hash function evaluated on xh. So you can think about m0 and m1 being uh, two keys, which are used for recovering the original message. And um, all right, so given this uh, quantum state and both c0 and c1, if you get the basis information, which is theta, then you can um, always learn xc and xh, and therefore read out both m0 and m1. This is pretty easy. But so, so the idea here to make sure you only get either m0 or m1, but not both, uh, is basically to have a special mechanism that only gives the basis information after a com certain computation is done for a certain depth. Here we use this cryptographic tool called time lock puzzle. So it can be seen as a form of time release encryption. And only after computing for a certain amount of time or depth, this, this encryption will reveal uh, the original uh, plain text or the encrypted data, which is the basis information. Key. So therefore, the construction consists of three different uh, parts. The first part is the BB84 states, which stores uh, both XC and XH in two compatible bases. And the second part uh, is two uh, encryptions they are used to encrypt uh, M0 and M1. And finally, which is the time lock puzzle, which is used to um, encrypt or, or store the basis information and will only reveal the basis information after a certain amount of time. Okay, so um, before we look at the idea behind the proof, 
uh, I want to first mention that uh, indeed a very similar construction is uh, is already mentioned in the work by Unru in the revocable time release encryption. But I want to see that we indeed focus on different target. So in our work, we focus on cryptography against uh, depth bounded adversaries. But uh, for the work by Unru, he's in indeed interested in achieving new functionalities, even against full, uh, full, full scale quantum computers. Okay, so I think it's uh, time to look at what property we need from BB84 states and how the uh, proof works in a high level. So um, this is the property we need uh, for the security of our construction, which we call it, uh, uh, the strong monogamy of entanglement property. This was first proved by Koff and Vidic for cosine states, of which BB84 state can be viewed as a special case. So this monogamy of entanglement game for BB84 is defined as follows. So first of all, an unknown BB84 state is given to a quantum algorithm. The algorithm then uh, generates a potentially entangled quantum state, row one and row two, and sends them to two separate quantum algorithms which can not communicate with each other. So there's no communication uh, happening between them. Then the description of the basis is sent to both algorithms. But this algorithm you know, still cannot communicate with each other. And their goal is to come out with uh, XC and XH respectively. So we call the left guy Alice and the, uh, and the guy on the right side Bob. So they want to produce XC and XH respectively. And the harness of this task uh, you know, will be used uh, improving the security of our construction. And finally, I want to um, note that uh, if the description of the basis is given to the very first algorithm, which is the algorithm on the top, then the game is indeed easy. Because having both the BB84 states and its uh, basis uh, description, one can easily extract both XC and XH. This is something we already mentioned in the last slide. And similarly, if these two algorithms can communicate with each other, the problem also becomes trivial. So here, um, the, the subtlety, the tricky part here is that the basis information is only revealed after the state is plated and the, this Alice and Bob cannot communicate with each other. And only in this situation, this game is, uh, this, this, this game is uh, indeed difficult. So given the property uh, called monogamy of entanglement, uh, strong monogamy of entanglement, here is an informal proof of the security against depth bounded quantum adversary. So assume there exists a quantum, uh, a, a shallow quantum circuit that takes a one-time memory and output both M0 and M1. So here, uh, the chip uh, in the middle of the slide is the, the shallow quantum circuit, which takes the one-time memory uh, and output both M0 and M1 simultaneously. The idea is that at some point at some point of the circuit evaluation, the entire memory of the quantum circuit is classical. This is simply by having this uh, quantum circuit being shallow and and by the definition at certain step, everything will collapse and becomes classical. And furthermore, because there exists a time point where everything is classical, and also um, you know the circuit is shallow by the property of time lock uh, puzzle the internal memory of the quantum state can be decomposed into two parts. The first part is Z, which only depends on the BB84 states and both the encryption uh, C0 and C1. And the other part is only a function of the time lock path. And I want to emphasize that this is, uh, this is not exactly accurate, but uh, it's good enough for the proof intuition. And because the whole memory, the, everything about the uh, circuit is classical, we can, of course, copy this step. So we can duplicate that, and we have two, uh, two algorithms. They are uh, non-local, and both of the algorithms can produce M0 and M1 simultaneously. And next, we simply ask both parties to only compute M0 and M1, respectively. And if both of them can output M0 and M1 respectively, then we can further show that we can extract the secret keys for encrypting M0 and M1, which are exactly XC and XH. 
And if you look at that, that's very close to the strong monogamy of entang entanglement property we just dis uh, discussed about. And indeed, we can turn this proof intuition, and then we show, and we can turn that into a proof of uh, proof by contradiction, and show that if such shallow quantum circuit can produce m zero and m one simultaneously, then there exists uh, another quantum circuit that violate the the strong monogamy of entanglement property of BB eighty four states, which is a contradiction, and therefore such quantum algorithm and or such quantum adversary cannot exist. All right, so that's the proof intuition. And finally, let me motivate the security notion we consider here. And first of all, the security notion provides a win-win situation for quantum cryptography. If we ever construct a full-scale quantum machine, then basically all this groundbreaking application can be instantiated, including uh, quantum money and like quantum copy protection for softwares and many, many exciting applications. And we were in the very bright future of quantum computing and enjoy a lot of uh, benefits of quantum. I hope, and I guess most of us hope this is the case. But what if there exists an engineering barrier or even a physics barrier that prevents us from building a full-scale quantum computer? Then this one-time memory or this like quantum key distribution are still the excellent example showing the necessity of values of quantum computing. So that's the first reason that is this line of research indeed provides a win-win situation for us. And the other reason is that um, something I call the uh, fine-grained quantum cryptography. And you know, even with full-scale quantum computers, the security notion um, is still pretty meaningful. And the reason is that we can basically always set a polynomial P to be the depth bomb. And you know, there's like asymmetry between the honest evaluation and the malicious evaluation. For honest evaluation, only that P classical uh, circuit or classical uh, that uh, only only that P classical computation is needed, plus constant units of quantum computation. But meanwhile, unless a malicious party needs to, you know, have at least that P quantum computation, otherwise it cannot break this application. So as long as we believe quantum computation is much more expensive than classical computation, we can always set P to be some polynomial and achieve the security we want. So I think that still makes sense if we have full-scale quantum computer, as long as quantum is much more expensive than classical. So that's the motivation behind the security notion and the security model I consider in the work. And uh, that's the end of the talk. And I would like to thank everybody for your attention. And uh, that's it. Thank you.